Although the basics of a liquid cooler are pretty simple, it's really not that different from your car radiator, the inner workings of it are somewhat interesting and we have a lot of those details for you today. And besides, NZXT would not stop sending me these things until we did one of these videos on liquid coolers specifically. Before we get to the detail on permeation, stators, impellers, and chemical composition of the coolant, this video is brought to you by NZXT and their Kraken series of liquid coolers. Our in-house 3D animation that we'll be showing in this video was actually based off of a Kraken X52, which you can find in the link in the description below. We've torn apart a lot of liquid coolers and they're more or less the same when it comes to implementation of how they're cooling a CPU but they differ in terms of execution. So that would be the design and how the cooler actually comes out of the factory when it's done, because there are a few differences that are key to note. A few cooling products, for an example, will relocate the pump to be somewhere else in the system. So on some of the old Antec Dynatron made products, they had the pump located on the fan near the radiator or attached to the radiator. On a lot of these products from NZXT, from Corsair, from EVGA, really from most vendors, the pump is located on the CPU block itself. And then a couple folks like Deepcool do some really interesting stuff where they position the pump kind of on the block, but not quite for legal reasons. So there are a lot of different executions of the core function, which is to get a pump in the loop somewhere. But the difference is just how that's pulled off. Liquid coolers are mostly made by a few companies. One of them would be Azatec, who make the NZXT products, including the Kraken line, the Corsair products, or some of them anyway, EVGA products and Thermaltake CLCs. Coolit or CoolIT is known for Corsair, some of their products, and for data center cooling. Cooler Master makes their own, which is a bit different, and you may be interested to know that Cooler Master OEMs most of the Intel and AMD stock coolers as well, including the air coolers, while Asetech OEMs many of the stock liquid coolers. And then there are a couple of smaller companies that also exist in the space, largely consisting of Apaltech, known for Enermax and Lepa coolers, and Dynatron, known for some of Antex coolers. We have an older content piece about who makes your CLC, if you're curious to learn more about that aspect of it. But let's start by getting a foundational understanding. We can look at the torn down Kraken X42 that we previously disassembled on camera and start at the CPU block, then work our way around. The basics remain the same as our air cooler animation. Heat from the CPU die is conducted through TIM or solder into the IHS, which then transfers through another layer of TIM to the cold plate. That thermal interface helps deal with microscopic imperfections in the surface of the IHS or the cold plate, but is otherwise undesirable. It's got worse thermal conductivity compared to the flanking copper interfaces. These days, most CLC cold plates are circular and smooth, though there are older models that used tree-like ringed cold plate, and this is largely a manufacturing and production improvement in the die casting process to make those cold plates, because there are only a few cold plate suppliers just like there are only a few pump suppliers and so forth. Most plates are not now smooth instead of that ringed design. Some cold plate suppliers make the cold plate surface concave to better match the CPU IHS, with GPU cooling plates remaining generally flat. These days, again, with the most current generation of enthusiast grade liquid coolers like the Kraken X52 that we've modeled for this video, those cold plates are now flat. Generally, the manufacturing complexity of the concave indent was not worth the effort based on the folks we've spoken to in the industry, and going with a flatter, smoother surface generally seems to have an overall equivalent or superior performance gain anyway. The copper itself is thin by design with the side internal to the pump housing terminating in dense microfins. The density of the fins allows for greater surface area for heat spreading with heat being whisked away by straight flow or split flow liquid designs. Surface area is critical, but so is flow impedance. Fin density and fin pitch impact flow rate, which is directly controlled by pump speed, radiator design or heat exchanger design if you prefer, and manufacturer spec. It's up to the manufacturers, so that'd be folks like NZXT and their suppliers to work together on a custom solution for the product because a one-size-fits-all model, while deployable, doesn't mean it'll be the best performance out of box. Some coolers, but not all, will use a rubber gasket for split flow circulation. This sits between the housing and the cold plate and directs liquid down the center channel. Split flow minimizes dead zones on cold plates, though straight flow is an alternative that is also commonly used. As for liquid movement, that's pushed around by an impeller. The coolers we've dismantled lately all use an eight-pole impeller design, including the NZXT Kraken series, the Corsair H100 IB2 and 115 IB2, 
and the EVGA CLC products. As an aside, this also means that your BIOS readings of pump RPM will be incorrect, since BIOS is expecting a four pole fan PWM, but receiving eight. The maximum 12 volt pump RPM in most enthusiast grade CLCs tends to be in the range of 2,800 to 3,000 RPM, plus or minus about 10%, with the one standout difference being the Gen 4.5 EVGA GPU cooler at 3600 RPM. To help mitigate the noise impact from a high RPM, several cooling OEMs use a layer of foam padding between the pump internals and the outer shell. Our torn down X42 shows a big foam block used for this, aiding in vibration and noise reduction. Getting back to the basics, liquid moves up one tube and into the water tank on the radiator, which has a partition wall down the middle. The tube mounts to the radiator on a barb, which is generally either a three flange or single flange design. The single flange designs are used most commonly in server and data center use cases with Asetex leveraging piano wire to pinch the tube like a clamp. This helps sustain higher pressure in failure events, though three flange barbs are still rated for several times the pressure of what would ever be experienced in an enthusiast desktop setup anyway, so those tend to be more common for people in our audience. As the warmed liquid from the CPU feeds into the radiator, it travels down roughly half the channels and to the other side. This is the cooling process. Aluminum fins within the radiator core conduct heat away from the channels. Then the radiator fans dissipate that heat from the fins. You may also hear the phrase heat exchanger or hex. It really means the same thing as radiator when we're talking about this particular type of product. At the end of the channel, the liquid does a U-turn and travels back down to return to the other side receiving one more pass of cooling from the fan and the heat fins. And at this point, the liquid should be nearing its lowest temperature. That tends to be around 26 to 32 Celsius for the liquid temp, depending on the chemical composition of the liquid and the heat of the CPU being cooled. As for the liquid used, that tends to be a mix of propylene glycol and distilled water. Some manufacturers will use a higher percentage of one or the other, depending on what their goal is. For example, you might be targeting as a manufacturer support for something like a negative 40 C environment. If that's the case, you would probably run a higher percentage of propylene glycol or just glycol in the mix than distilled water. Most of the manufacturers tend to target around negative 20 C for their lowest technically within spec supported temperature. And uh, that is because of mostly shipping reasons, shipping and storage. They want to be able to support that. That's fine to make sure it doesn't freeze when you put it on a plane and ship it. Uh, but some folks do negative 40 C targets or greater or just around that area. The mixture of the liquid used for cooling can be modified by the supplier to fit that spec. And then finally, we have tubes which are generally made of either FEP or EPDM rubber. The more rigid tubes tend to be FEP, which has excellent reduction of permeation but it's a lot less flexible during installation. Kinking an FEP tube will result in cracking the inner PTFE or Teflon coating, which results in permeation and poor cooling ability. It's really a very bad thing when you crack that inner coating. That inner coating is what makes FEP good. EPDM rubber tubes have the opposite set of pros and cons. They really won't get damaged if you bend them a whole lot. They're more flexible but it does require a bit of an expensive R&D process to get the compound to a point of resisting permeation in a way that is competitive in the market. Finally, all of these things tend to have some sort of PCB in them. The simpler ones without all the Kraken styled crazy RGB LEDs use a smaller PCB that really serves one function, which is to host the firmware of the liquid cooler, while the more advanced models, that would be again this or something like the EVGA CLC we looked at or anything really with RGB LEDs in it, might have some sort of custom PCB. Generally, that's made by Ace Attack or the supplier, though in some cases, they do allow manufacturers to customize their own PCB as we talk about in our X42 teardown. That PCB is more or less the brains of the system. And then uh, depending on the manufacturer, depending on the unit you buy, it's possible they have some memory chips on there as well, some sort of storage to keep the profiles for pump speeds if the particular cooler allows manual tuning of the pump speed, a lot of them don't, uh, that can be stored on the PCB in some sort of memory, depending on which cooler you buy. So uh, these things are actually fairly complex for what they do. Considering air coolers are basically a radiator, which is just what a fin stack is, and a fan, uh, although they do have some complexity with the copper heat pipes, it's nothing near what a closed loop cooler does. 
Now, it's not to say it's the most complex thing we look at. Something like a GPU, of course, would be far more complicated. But for something that cools a CPU or a GPU, there's a lot going on here. And that's why we wanted to make a video about it, because uh, really there's a lot more under the hood of what's going on with these things than you might really realize when first looking at it. Though our teardowns do teach quite a bit, primarily don't use a drill to take apart a liquid cooler because it won't go back together. So that's all for this one. Check us out on Patreon. You can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly. The website, gamersnexus.net, will have a full article for this if you're curious to learn more. Thank you for watching. Subscribe for more. I'll see you all next time.